I've been calling Bitcoin hit 20,000 since it was at like 55. Mm-hmm. If Michael Saylor gets margin called, what effects could it have on the broader market in terms of crypto and what kind of like contagion level event could we expect for those who are like retail investors in it? Well, the, the 85% drawdown number is 10,300. And that's the dirty number that we've been saying and people don't like hearing yeah. that. Mm. And I, I, I made a tweet on Twitter. It's my favorite place to tweet on Twitter. We make that joke. <laughs> but I, I made a tweet back in January and I got crucified for it. I said, if you don't think Bitcoin that. can go below 20K, then you must be new here. And people are like, what Facts. an idiot. Bottom is in, you know, price is definitely going up now when you got the YouTuber saying that. It's not so funny right now, is it? And At you know, all. People, No. And, and uh, you know, we have been... 22,000 is a very important number because that's where the 200 week moving average is. Right. And when you look over time, it's always hit the 200 week moving average. It has wicked down to the 300 week moving average before, which I don't quite know what that number is off the top of my head, but 22,000 could be a potential for a bottom, but we targeted 24,500 would kind of be the first level. And now we pierced through that. Now we're looking at 22,000. After that, you go to the psychological level of 20,000. After that, Strong support at 17,000 yeah, yeah. and you have 14,000 14, yeah. and then under 14. Now you're going down to 10. And then after that, like all bets are off the table. So the, the answer to your question is I'm not worried about Michael Saylor. If the price gets to 21,000, which is his margin call point, because they're going to add more collateral, you know, they can add more to keep from actually getting liquidated there. They can add to their position. I'm much more worried about Michael Saylor. If the price does drop down to 10,000. And when you look at, what the attack that Citadel, I do believe some people are saying, oh, you know, it's not actually true. Citadel and BlackRock are the ones that moved against Doquan. They moved Thank against, you. absolutely. There's no question about it. Who else got that kind of money and power to do that? Um, so they went after Doquan. They went after Terra Luna. They went after UST. And I'm kind of afraid that right now we are start, we are going to see any vulnerability that exists out there in crypto. These people are going to be attacking. Them. They're going to expose them. And the, and the truth is they need to be exposed because if you have a big vulnerability, it's always going to eventually get exposed. So let's go ahead and do it now while we're in the bear market and get it over with instead of stopping a big bull run down the road. Um, but I, I think when you look at Michael Saylor, what I'm a little concerned about, and I like, I, I, like, I'll be honest, I know. I, so somebody said, I think that y'all are going to go after Michael Saylor or some point. I like him personally. I think he's genuine. I think he really does love Bitcoin. I have said before. He's newer, so there's been a little naiveness as not yeah. being through a full market cycle, which he's experiencing now. But I'm a little concerned that people with much bigger pockets than Michael Saylor are going to find whatever that number is that he can't add more to that position. Some people are calling for 7,000 or 3,500. Like These are numbers yeah. people throw out there. I don't think we go that low. But I'm I'm more nervous about someone directly attacking that number to push it down to liquidate him. So I don't know what the number is that he couldn't bear anymore. But that's probably what they're going yeah, to target. Yeah, I did the calculation. The number is 9,856. 9, oh, that's so close to 10,300. It's like where they would knock them out. Yeah. I, I truly believe, and I said it with Kathy in 2020, anytime we have any superstar investors, it feels as if the top institutions wants to knock that person out of favor. Absolutely. And they begin aggressively attacking their positions. Mm -hmm. I hate that he's just the next one that got caught up in that. Why do you think a lot of retail investors don't believe technicals don't matter in Bitcoin or crypto? Yeah, well, I, I think that it's just data, right? It's it's the the length of data that we have. But when you really look at technicals, you look at charts, and I'll be honest with you, like I'm not a technicals driven person. I'm much more fundamentals. We have a great technical analyst here at Bitcoin Crypto. We got 60 employees here, so we we run we run really deep. We got experts in everything. Uh, but for me, like charts are just kind of boring to me. If I'm really honest with you, um, I don't have the patience to sit down. I, I've done a lot of trading before. Actually, uh, leverage trading. I turned eighty thousand into a million last January. You know, what nice. I did. I said, I'm done. <laughs> I said, I'm what, out. I'm going to take my money in right Bitcoin. Okay. That's yeah. amazing. That's well, amazing. It, it, so I have a bullish bias. Like, I, I just know that about, because really you can't be in this crypto space like I am and not have a bullish bias to see all the things behind the scenes that go on. You know yeah. where this is going down the road. And so when things are go short-term bad, you're like, I don't get it, you know? So for me, it was just perfect timing because in January, things were really going up and in February as well. And so my bullish bias kicked in and basically whenever... We had a dip. I was just going long and I was, I was using irresponsible leverage. I was doing like 25 X, but uh, you know, it was very irresponsible. No one else do this. No one else do this, you know, but the, the quantitative easement was still on the table. So it was exactly. in your favor. For, yeah. Yeah. Great. And you guys hit that on the head. I heard what you guys said before I came on the show. You guys hit that on the head. You look at the quantitative easing chart compared to the tech stocks. 
It's the same chart. It's Absolutely. insane. That's where all the money went. So, but, but the, the truth is I am smart enough to know that the technicals do matter. It doesn't matter really how much data you have. Charts are charts. Charts are the psychology of human behavior. It is mm -hmm. the decision-making of a person based on the last price action. It goes all the way back to Japan and, and you know, hiking on sheet candles and, and rice trading. It's human psychology. It's, it, it's not rocket science here, you know? And so people are generally going to behave certain ways. And, and you know how you know that's true? Everybody's depressed right now. <laughs> you know, like Absolutely. everybody's... Even those of us that have been through this and, and we're like you're super OGs when it comes to going through these market cycles, like it doesn't feel good, you know, yeah. especially for people that got in crypto late. And like, I know, I'm sure that you guys feel responsibility to your audience like I do. Absolutely. And when you see how that your people are hurting and you know that like, okay, we know they're going to get through this if they stay here, but you know, a certain percentage of people are going to leave. And that's really, really sad. That proves the emotions that exist within a market cycle. And so the technicals do matter because the emotions matter, because we all go through the same experiences. Let me, let me ask you this. XRP, mm. um, Ripple, uh, I, I watched a post on Instagram that you made where he said that they turned down a settlement mm. from the SEC and he was very, um, you know, he was very passionate Passion. about your delivery on yeah. that. So Shout out to the <laughs> army. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can you talk about, you know, a lot of, yeah, the XRP army. Can you talk yeah. about that? What, what sure. does that actually mean? And, uh, and what's your thoughts on XRP? So it's very interesting. Um, basically, last year, towards the end of the year, or no, not towards the end of the year, like right around the May crash, I got in touch with this guy who was, uh, we called him Mr. Mr. X on the channel. He's got to reach out to me, gave me a lot of good information. It all turned out to be true up to a certain point. He told me the market was definitely bouncing back the, in the middle of July. We literally got down to the last day of the middle of July, which was like the 20th. And sure enough, it did exactly what he said it was going to do. He told me about a lot of the China Bitcoin mining stuff before it happened. He told me they were moving to Kazakhstan. All of a sudden, all these stories start coming out. And so it was really, really good information for a time. He said 100K was in the cards by the end of the year. That didn't happen. He told me the XRP case was going to be settled by the end of September. And we talked about that a lot on my channel. And mm -hmm. I got crucified because it didn't happen. As you guys know that when you make calls and things don't happen the way you think they do, especially if it's kind of based on information and it's not, yeah. you know, and we kind of got a little lazy towards the end of the year because I started leaning too much on that information because it seemed good instead of doing what we're good at, which is the analysis. But the, the point is, is it's very interesting. Jed McCaleb, who was formerly with Ripple, he was one of the founders. Uh, he actually split with Ripple right around the time of the token sale. And it was, he sold XRP at a huge settlement. No one has made more money on Ripple than Jed McCaleb. Uh, I think it's about a billion dollars that he's made where Brad Garlinghouse and Chris Larson, I think uh, about 500 million was what was in the, the SEC uh, lawsuit. So the point here is in September, he stopped selling for the first time. He didn't sell in September. He didn't sell in October. He didn't sell in November. He didn't sell in December. He starts selling again in January. And something is not making sense to me because I'm like, this case is supposed to be over. All of the new stops uh, right about the beginning of November all the news stuff. We got no news from the case from like November to February. Well, this weekend at Consensus, a uh, big conference, uh, I spoke directly uh, with uh, someone who I'm very close with that is um, someone I trust 100%, would not make this up. And I can't say where he got this information from because I, it would expose him a little bit, and that's why. But he told me straight up that last year, straight from the horse's mouth he heard this, that ripple turn down a settlement. I think the information we had was good. I think this was going to end last year, mm -hmm. but it's really actually good for the market that it didn't because the, everything was so overheated. It probably would have been cut short. This may work out better for the price actually, because I think it's going to, the suppression of this bull run is going to make ripple go to the moon, as we say Crazy. in the next bull yeah. run. Yeah. But, but the truth is, is that um, they have the sec by the balls right now. You know, mm. and every single month it looks worse and worse and worse for the SEC. SEC that right, and the reason they made that decision was because they said point blank, we have them and we are going to outright win. So we have been pushing the idea of a settlement for a long time. I no longer believe that. I believe that the SEC is going to get totally defeated, and not only that, but after this case, I think we are going to see a major overhaul at what happens at the SEC, um, because you've got to understand that towards the end of this year, if we look at our current economic situation. And, and we look at these midterm elections coming up. You have to understand if we're in a recession, there's no way we don't get big changes in what's going on in Washington Absolutely. because that's what happens when the markets are down. And if that happens, 
I think we will see some some people going directly after the SEC, uh, and we will get changes to that organization. I, the, the SEC is the most corrupt organization in the history of the world. My graduates from my school being Forbes, bag drop. Bag drop. <laughs> a mic drop. Bag drop. Bag drop. <laughs>